I'm very happy to share some insights uh, today. This is the first like overall paradigm with in which I would like to uh, share the overall concept, which is to give the meaning of all my research I did in asylum camps was to apply the theory of origins of language into the refugee field. Because during all those years I observed severe mistranslation, misunderstanding and miscommunication and I think it is all pretty linked to lack of trust and lack of um, questions, lack of communication in general. So um, I would elaborate on all these points now. Just briefly, my fieldwork uh, when I came back from England and I finished my PhD, I started to do some observations in asylum camps and then I proceeded on asylum courts. Um, then I had a special focus on interpreting in the legal field and I also shared some of the insights with teachers uh, who were designing their lessons while having an immigrant child in their classrooms. Um, just recently we also made some kind of short guidance how to uh, overcome a cultural shock when entering Slovakia with the help of all the foreigners who are living there trying to um, explain what is happening with them while they communicate in Eastern Europe. Uh, just to give you a brief example of five millions of Slovaks, um, it is not even the size of London, just a very tiny nation. So out of all our citizens, we have only hardly over 1% of foreigners, out of which most of it is just neighbors, which is Czech Republic, Poland, Ukraine, Hungary, and Austria. Uh, so it's pretty um, homogeneous. And out of all those very small number of foreigners, we have only these numbers, and it's not in thousands. Uh, people, <laughs> it's literal numbers of people who apply for asylum. So you can see it's really tiny. This year it has been only one person who has been granted asylum. Um, and even most of those people flee to Western countries, obviously because their relatives and their communities are already here or in Germany or in France or elsewhere in Europe. Uh, and today's presentation will be kind of explaining why does it happen and what kind of um, experiences immigrants share with each other, why, why they go rather further. So the asylum procedure, as you might all know, it should be fairly the same in all, f all Europe as we all follow the Dublin regulation. But the thing is even after, even before you get the interview, your fingerprints are taken and uh, what counts is the first state of European Union when you enter the asylum system. So those who are unlucky to be told you are already in Germany and they found out they are not in Germany, they are in Slovakia because they don't know, they are put from the lorry in, a, in, in some woods. Uh, they encounter the police and when they mm, acknowledge that this is not the right system they want to see, sit, be with, they are returned again to Slovakia and wait for up to six months to get a final decision. So there are many points in which uh, one can be misunderstood or summarized or shortened and the story um, is somewhat, som somehow not elaborated enough. Um, these are the statements of police people. Um, in order to be more safe, they say, they claim, we, we are taking away your documents. Um, so people can't even hold their own passports or diplomas or uh, things they carry with them. So legal representatives try to um, interfere with it and, and 
make some <laughs> corrections, but it's not always the case that it happens. Uh, what they receive instead is some kind of small paper of, of this quality, uh, which they have to carry with them all the time. And uh, on basis of having such a, you know, very f easily uh, falsifiable document, uh, no one will be able to give them bank account or or whatever kind of um, um, so it's right. All the real documents, the passports and the papers, they get a bit of paper which can easily be forged. Yes. Nobody takes any notice of. Yes. It. Yes. And um, if we are talking on the workshops um, about their rights, they would say, oh, we are here to guard the Schengen border. So we are literally pressed not to be too much open and taken. There is a myth of transitory country. So if, you say, if we hear the politicians, Slovakia is transitory country, I have never met an asylum applicant who would agree with such a statement. And all those who were severely persecuted <coughs> would claim that, okay, we are searching for a peaceful country and we don't mind where we stay unless there is, there is absence of war. So it's really a myth which is supported by media and politicians, but not by asylum applicants themselves. This is just a small crude joke, uh, which is reminding us of the, the power of identity cards or passports or whatever. Um, as an anthropologist, um, I met with Anthony Good from University of Edinburgh, uh, who was talking about rule-oriented and relationally-oriented approaches. These two contrasting paradigms um, produce real clash of in in communication because when we when we meet um, <coughs> there is always a search for a general rule which is not um, explicable in terms of exceptions, of relations, of something special, of an individual case. So there is a search to, to, to fit you to a paragraph, to fit you to a general rule, which doesn't leave enough room for individual case. So this is briefly, I know in generalization it doesn't apply all the time, but mostly this is the case of first misunderstanding um, during research. Um, so when did I realize it was during workshops uh, with all those groups of people moving in the legal field or in asylum field. Uh, whether it was asylum applicants I was preparing for the court when I discovered that they have no idea what is going to happen when they appeal um, because they, their asylum have been refused. Uh, I was also having um, workshops with refugee camp staff about the rights of people in the camps, or about the, their possible understanding of, of our rules. And with all those, we had many discussions on how to, how to find the ways, how to ask open questions and not to put people into boxes or into the far paragraphs. Is it possible? Um, this is very paradoxical example of just recent attempt of Slovak Migration Office when they really felt the need to produce a handbook of cultural orientation. Um, there were, you know, imagine a room big, like half of this room, and there would be 20 experts called together so that they would discuss together how, what kind of values could be put forward. And the difference between 2017 and 2007, possibly, was that um, all of us, mo mostly all of us, refused to take part in such a strange project. Uh, because there were, there are so many different values and because we, we don't feel negative emotions, in, not from all, negative emotions in Slovakia. 
So, kind of very strange project. But the handbook is out, and uh, most of us sitting there agreed with a female vicar who, who pointed very clearly that we ourselves will be the first ones to violate it. Um, so there will be just one example of we, are, we were worried um, quite a lot about is that they, the migration office needed to strengthen the argument as if they were producing it, I mean, in, in, in the media, that in Slovakia violence is banned. But in, at the same time, violence, another... Violence against women and children. Yes. At the same time, a new facility in central Slovakia for abuse women was opened. And uh, just recently there was also a project that every fifth woman in Slovakia experiences domestic violence. So it is rather paradoxical that they still kind of maintain the image of right-wing videos. So this is a kind of le legitimization of all their um, attempts. So I have provided a short framework. Now tell me, uh, let me turn to details of an <coughs> asylum procedure. It's a kind of balance, <coughs> balancing over a big depth. Uh, I would start first with what is written in the law since 1951. What is in bold? There are those those concepts uh, which are in question during interviews. So we will first focus on what does it mean to have a fear and what does it mean persecution. Uh, the thing is that uh, after the migration officer listens to your story, it's not even correct, after you, you answer the questions of migration officer, um, he kind of compares it with the country of origin information. There is a separate department who checks your argument. But the term objectivity is used very often. Um, and what if you have no proof, no video, no document, no special mm, evidence? So. So the past tense is something very interesting because the lawyers always say we should look onto the future. They are, they are having fear from what could have happened or what is going to happen if we stay, not what has happened already. So if it happened, I wouldn't be here. So what's the point? Why do you, um, in your verdicts, why do you mention the past tense when it's about the future? And they also focus very much on visible things. So if you are missing your hand or leg, that's a proof. But if you are mm, missing your identity or your rights, uh, it's not sufficient. So the basic points uh, get lost um, when, when they somehow uh, refuse to talk about what they are afraid of and instead they talk about whom they are afraid of. So if I they mention we are afraid of our own police, we are afraid of our politicians, we are afraid of, of our chiefs, it's not enough because the migration officer will not get that point because he can't imagine possibly what such people are going to do. But to, to tell about the traumatic experiences of your family and about the details is already re-traumatizing the persons. That's and this is yeah, something... That's describing like in Syria, if you say I'm afraid of Assad's secret police, <laughs> where they come from, everyone knows that means that's the last you'll ever be heard of if you get into their hands. But, you know, and, and, and the, 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 the courts and the judges don't recognize that. And they, you know, and they, they want to know what you're afraid of. And of course the, the applicant is, doesn't, doesn't want to go into it in detail because maybe their brother, their wife, their children have already had being talked to them, disappeared Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So it's the exact opposite of ethnographic interview. With what, what would be. So, so what, what an administration uh, expects is something like an old, uh, rep um, it, 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 was, it was invented before Xerox machine. 
So, so it is pretty much like, okay, um, I will stop you now because it seemed to be too awkward. Be logical, be relevant. But whose is the logic? Whose is the relevance? Whose, whose order it is? So imagine you have about 42 questions in the law on asylum and 41 questions are concerned with your origins, with your relatives, with, with the countries you crossed, with the exact dates, uh, and only 40 seconds, 40 seconds, seconds. the 40 second question is kind of open, tell me more about why are you asking for asylum? But you are so much exhausted <laughs> with these 41 questions that... Um, so the policy is, okay, let's, let's put your story into the questionnaire. Um, it's kind of as if the people were one of the boxes. So you have your own file, you, are, you have your own number. But what is happening is like what is happening in our brain. It's pretty much flexible. We jump from subject to subject. Um, or while we are talking, the memories come up. The more details we can talk about, the, the more we remember. And then, you know, inconsistencies everywhere. So this is something we take for granted, but it doesn't fit with expectations of legal people. So what do you think is this? Sorry? It's, it's a print. It's something that's going to print. Yeah, some, some, it, it's, it's, a, it's a part of yeah. printing machine. Yeah. But this, this is an actual stereotype. This is how the, how the word was first used. The word stereotype was first used for this piece of getting the print cheaper. And also the word cliche is a sound of turning this cliche, 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 cliche. <laughs> so this is exactly what is happening in our mind. Okay, let's avoid exceptions. Let's, let's just reproduce what is already fixed. So as you see here, this connection is quite costly to get. And it's very costly to get another connection. So instead of having a new connection, let's use the highways, not a sideways. So, so it's, it's pretty easy. Um, to follow what has been already there. Um, so for example, the stereotype house. In Turkish, the house of my grandfather is not an actual house with an address. It is an ancestral region with kinship ties. Imagine for an hour, the officer was waiting for an exact number until they got to the point, okay, it's in the house. It's really, it's a region. It's you, you will not get the number. Um, but this happens so often with all kinds of categories that it's kind of sad and it might change the meaning of the overall story. Um, so here we have plenty of categories behind all these. I will give you more examples when um, the same words have a completely different meaning and even a translator, even an interpreter, uh, if he's not asked a clarifying question, will not get into the details what it really means. For example, all, all well-known example of brother and cousin. In many African countries, these two are used interchangeably, but it was a kind of proof of untrustworthiness for a person I spent five years with five years he was elaborating on many details of this sort to get through that he lived under one roof with his cousin calling him brother that it is not an actual inconsistency it's a fact which is like normal to him in his own country um, and you're saying that when they find out that it's not your real brother and it's just a cousin yes, that you're obviously lying and being honest yes yes of course so more examples uh, as you can see, these cultural categories very much um, link to the categories from the Convention of Refugees. So uh, what, what, what do the terms mean for us is something completely different than it mean, what it means to, to legal people. Um, I was... Um, Rogers Brubaker uh, is making the point 
okay, don't stick to those terms as something static, as something objective. But this is something which you rarely uh, can discuss with lawyers because they take it as a fixed concept, which is properly, um, you know, static. So, for example, okay, ethnicity. Um, what if the class, education, and occupation is much more important than ethnicity? How how will we proceed this elementary um, finding of anthropology? Another <coughs> example: social group is in particular sensitive category because if um, females, children or LGBT people ask for asylum, this can be recognized pretty easily. But supposedly you are persecuted because of your own vocation. That is not recognized that you are a member of a particular social group. But this is the case in which um, most of the asylum speakers I talk to are saying as soon as the regime comes in, we, meaning all these, are the first ones to be dead. Just because we have this occupation. So there is no individual threat. So uh, what kind of uh, proof would, would you have other than having one of these vocations. Uh, the most crude example I would have is an example of a judge from Afghanistan who was address addressing a Slovak judge, explaining his case that he um, was threatened by Taliban people and because he refused to cooperate and he refused to deliver them and uh, his money. They took his daughter and returned it to him chopped to pieces in one big uh, sack. And then they said, if, uh, if this is not enough, we will take your sons as well. And the judge in the verdict said, um, it is your own subjective belief that it was Taliban people. So subjectivity was another, again, used. Your, and he said, shall I take you to the grave of my daughter in Kandahar? May I? How, how can I? What kind of proof may I deliver to you? But she somehow uh, was smiling and called. He succeeded on the highest court and the highest court ordered migration office, what if you again listen to this man and acknowledge that because he's a judge he was persecuted not individually just because he they uh, imagined he would have enough money to share it with talibans so and he was missing one eye and he was severely injured himself this was still not enough to persuade the judge that his case is serious um, he was given though a subsidiary protection it was on the one of the first slides, which is called small asylum. So this means that you are given an inter international protection for one year and it can be prolonged many times until the conflict finishes. So as if the officials mm, were expecting, okay, in Syria it will be over soon and then or in, Afga in Afghanistan you can come back very early. So why should we give you a proper asylum if we can give you only subsidiary one. But the thing is that you have problems to get um, proper integration when you have papers only for one year. And of course, how can you get a job <laughs> if uh, every nine months it's, uh, it has to be renewed? Another um, example of a religious person, not actually, it was not a religious person even, but the applicant was persecuted um, because he was a brother of someone politically active and in, in a religious conflict. 
Mm. The closed questions didn't allow to elaborate the, his argument and he was not able to deliver all the reasons he had. Uh, funnily, uh, in Slovakia, persecution for being someone's relative is not a stereotype anymore, but it was in the 50s. There were not just my grandfather, many other grandfathers were put into prison because they were relatives of someone politically active. Uh, as if those people um, have had short memory or the, you know the political climate has changed uh, very much so um, even the lawyer uh, who was ha trying to help the asylum applicant didn't succeed because um, they are taken as someone who already knows the law and who would try to fit his story into the law so it's better not to interfere too much. So, as, as we all know, people tend to remember more easily if the information matches the stereotype. So the whole concept of unlearning is first to recognize what is there, what I have there already, what shall I declutter, what shall I recognize, I need to get rid of, and then a different question is possible. So it's like a full room of clutter and there is no space for another question, possibly. There is no space. So it's not about asylum seekers, it's about our contents we need to recognize first. And in the, in the first title you would see examples from camps, but also classrooms or businesses. It's the same logic. It doesn't matter whether it's in camp or in a classroom or in, in business communication. So this is the stereotype of our memory. People usually would say it would be the first association, oh, what I put there, I just take out. But memory is not the larger. Each time we talk about our memories, we shape it, we, we re-record it, we, we even change details and we can even create false memories. But, but this is something what people in legal professions rarely admit, rarely accept and rarely work with. Something again with in social sciences is quite obvious for years. Um, just uh, two years ago, Memory and Law, wonderful book, was published in, I think it was uh, Oxford University Press, uh, sharing the recent <coughs> insights of neuroscience for lawyers. How should they proceed very differently while talking to witnesses? Um, because these, these seven scenes of memory are are so often present in everyday life, why shouldn't be there in the courtroom? So let us work with it in a different way. But what happens in those interviews is the concept of a larder. So the questions decision makers could possibly ask differently would be what anthropologists are doing um, on a daily basis. <laughs> What are taken for granted assumptions? What is there in my own spaces? What do I carry from my own culture? What do I carry from my own background? And what do I actually listen? So we always have like separate notes, okay? I, I have to check, did I understood well? What did I understood actually? Um, what if the questions didn't even have the question mark at the end? But if there will be the most open, um, just let me let me start to 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 just give you a thick description. But if it's the forty the forty second question at the end, it rarely happens. So it's not only in Slovakia. The bad news is that these findings uh, you would find in any asylum court. Um, Katrin Marins has been doing her research in Belgium, um, then it's in, uh, in uh, Australia, and uh, they would all agree that there is a lot of mis and misinterpretation going on in all phases of mm, listening. So imagine that you deliver a speech 
not even the speech, you, you deliver a sentence, you are stopped, you are, you are interrupted, then something else appears in the transcription. So the judge would dictate to, a, to someone sitting next to him or to her and changes the sentence which you actually tell to something else. The same happens in the migration office. So the interviewer doesn't write what he hears, literally, but what he thinks what was said. So, so the, there is first change from language to language. So the interpreter makes the first change, the first summary, and then the second summary is made by an interviewer. So you have like third version of something. And also when you use legal terms and you speak like a legal person, it is pretty much simplified. And sometimes even the meaning is completely changed. So the asylum applicant, for example, sometimes they are told they would be um, put in camps and they end up in detention centers, which means that very big difference uh, concerning their um, personal freedom of, you know, movement. Um, and also linguistically, um, there, is, there is complete linguistic freedom on the side of legal people, but no linguistic freedom for asylum applicants, again. So we have like uh, different jargons or registers. So we have legalese, we have academies, we have some kind of travelies, but legalese is the one which is lawfully untranslated. It's, there is absolutely no translation of, of this particular language on its own. Um, only the recognized languages are translated and even though, even in this case, sometimes you are not even talking in your mother language. So if there is um, a difficulty to get the interpreter from your own language, you would get someone, let's say, Russian instead of um, um, Uzbek. So you're saying if, it's, if, if the court officials are speaking in legalese, they assume this doesn't need translation? No. That's obvious. Yes. That's right. But everything Dapper. else needs to be translated. Yes. It yes. It's just obvious. It's legal yes. language. Yes. Yeah. yes. Of course. Um, and most interpreters would be um, not professionals. So that, that's another case of, imagine they, their language is much worse than mine today. So imagine I would be translating to someone interpreting his own story, not using the legal termi terminology properly and not being able to have such a rich vocabulary which needs to be um, um, given for all these details. Um, even more, uh, what is expected from interpreters, and they are not happy at all, of course, uh, they are taken as, you know, as if they were not changing anything at all. So be kind of a pipe, or be kind of a parrot, or be kind of, you know, um, someone who is, who is really pure. Uh, this uh, initiative, uh, from from t two years ago, uh, is very you know useful um, meeting of people in American Association of Applied Linguistics, where legal anthropologists, uh, social ling social linguists, uh, applied uh, applied anthropologists, all kinds of people agreed and gave suggestions what could be done in the beginning to help. Um, to translate the legal language in the first instance. Just before we translate from language to language, acknowledge that there is untranslated piece. Um, in some cases, individual judges really do it. In some cases, it's, it's, mm, they're aware of it. But in most cases, this is not done yet. Um, so this is on the way. Also video recording or even recording the interview, now it is compulsory, but it's rarely done. 
You say it's compulsory. It's compulsory, but, but rarely not done. done. Not done, yes. Although it's compulsory, nobody does it. Because it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, you have to use all the machines and who, who would bother with it and who will check with it, you know, because you could easily say that, okay, I didn't get a good, nice interpreter, but if you can come back to, to the recording. But if you don't have a recording, who will prove it? So, uh, but especially, you know, I'm in particular interested in this point. How can we change the questions? How can we get to the point that it is us who can change uh, and, and who can really elaborate on finding out what is going on? So the concept of healing justice uh, is Terminus Technicus, uh, um, inspired by customary law of tribal people who were able to have their justice without all the institutions of present societies. Uh, and by observing them, they would agree again on how we can proceed. Sure, there are those judges who really do provide descriptive interpretations. Their verdicts are much longer and they can ask open questions, but it, it um, really requires someone who is fully aware of what's going on there. So coming back to criticized theory, um, if we are to begin talking to one another, as we must, we have to start developing terms and concepts we can all share. The barriers between us have no scientific basis, they are institutionally, politically imposed. For progress to be made, we have to break through the terminological, methodological and disciplinary frontiers which have got us all apart. So this is exactly what is happening in the legal field with asylum applicants. How can we break through all these barriers? So if we do not take these issues on board, we are, recording, we are returning to the condition of our species before we had even developed language as such. So, I have to tell that indeed too many officials actually describe immigrants as animals, unofficially of course, in breaks, you know, in, in between. And many immigrants do the same, because they, they, they feel rejected. But the reason why I still hope uh, is that, that I also came across wonderfully empathetic officials. On all levels, I mean, I mean policemen, uh, um, decision makers in migration office, judges, interpreters, anyone, social workers who really are aware what it means to be human and who really ask open questions. So these are the references. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>